Hello and welcome to another lesson on language development. In this lesson, we're going to talk about something called categorical perception in infants um, and whether that is innate or whether that is entirely learned. So the first question we have to answer um, is what is categorical perception? Um, and I'm going to demonstrate what categorical perception is using a um, phonetic uh, variable called voice onset time. Now, you, can, you have categorical perception based on all kinds of variables, but this is an easy one to illustrate, and so we're going to talk about this first. Now, voice onset time is a property of um, sounds like P, B, T, D, K, and G, which are called plosive consonants. Um, and it basically uh, involves two variables. The voice onset time involves two variables. And the first variable is the release. Now, when you make a plosive consonant, um, you do it by actually closing off some part of your airway. So this is a person's airway, and you can see at the left side there's a nose and some lips, and, and you can see inside the person's mouth, right? So that's their tongue sitting behind their teeth. And the, and the lips in this picture are closed, um, and that's because the airway is being cut off. This person is making a P or a B sound, right? So when you make a P or a B sound, you close your lips, and pressure builds up behind your lips, and then eventually you release that closure, right? So that's called a closure, and eventually you release it, and that really, this is a little burst of air, which you can actually hear in the acoustic signal of the sound, right? So releasing a closure, this is called the release, um, is one of the variables, one of the, one of the moments that goes into calculating the voice onset time is the moment at which you release that stop and create that burst of air. Now, the other um, variable is called voicing onset, um, the onset of voicing. At what point does voicing turn on? Now, voicing onset ha um, is, is um, dependent on your vocal cords, which are way down deep in your, in your vocal tract. Um, and that's what makes the sound when you, when you actually you know, can feel your voice box vibrating. So your vocal cords are in your voice box. And that's what makes the, the um, loud sounds of speech. Um, and so if you watch this video, um, you can see when the speech sound is produced. So it goes like this. So no sound, no sound, ah, right? So that's, that's what it looks like when you produce that sound. And there is a moment where you bring your vocal cords together, and that is the onset of voicing. So here, I'll, I'll play this again, and we can look at when that happens. Right there, that's the onset of voicing. That's the voicing onset. Um, and it's a moment. So we have two moments here, um, and we can measure, measure their time relative to one another in order to create different sorts of stop consonants. So the basic question when we're measuring voice onset time is how long um, is it between the onset of voicing and the release of the stop consonant? Um, now you can do it. Let's look at this sound. Um, so this is one stop consonant. Ba. Ba, which we perceive as a B. Um, now, when we look at this, uh, this waveform of, of this syllable, ba, um, we have two moments which we can see. The first one, which is the most obvious, is when the sound gets quite a bit louder all of a sudden, and you get this sort of funky little um, moment that looks like a funky little moment in the middle, and that's the release. Um, you can see that in a waveform. You can also see it in a spectrogram. Um, it's a little bit easier to tell to tell these apart when you've got a waveform and a spectrogram. So if you can't see it in the waveform, it, it's not surprising that you wouldn't be able to see that. But this is called the release. Um, and you can see that because you've got wiggly lines going to the left of the release there, um, that voicing has already started by the time you get a release um, in this sound. And so the onset of voicing is when it goes from silence to sound which is there. So that's the voicing. And we measure voice onset time from the release. So we measure it in that direction. So this actually produces a voice onset time, which is negative, And this is about negative 250 milliseconds of voice onset time. And it creates this sort of ba sound, right? So let's hear it again. Ba. Right? It, it happens after um, you, you get this, this, your voice box starts going before you open your mouth, right? Now, it's also possible to do it in the other direction. So this is what it looks like in the other direction. Um, so here, you don't have that long squiggly line going off to the left. You just have 
um, an immediate moment where you can see, um, well, this is a P sound. So this is this this is what we hear as a P and pa pa right. Um, and and in this sound we have uh, voicing doesn't start until there, um, but the release happens on the left side, right? So here we have a different ordering of release and voicing. We measure from release still, and so this creates a positive voice onset time, and this is about 35 milliseconds. This is about a 35 millisecond voice onset time, right? So you can see that you can you, but you could have any um, variation between those. You could have an onset time of zero if voicing and release happen at the same moment. You could have an onset time of negative, you know, 32, right? So this is a whole spectrum of of possible voice onset times. Um, so what is categorical perception? Categorical perception comes about um, uh, when, when we actually listen to how much different sounds vary from each other and how much the, our, our perception changes. So let's look at this. So this is a um, timeline of potential voice onset times, right? So here we have the release, um, and, and each of those little red lines indicates a place where you could have um, the onset of voicing, right? So a whole spectrum of different times you can have onset of voicing. Um, now let's listen to what each of those sound like. So here's here's some little sounds we can listen to. We're going to listen. Negative 250 milliseconds sounds like this. Ba. Negative 200 milliseconds. Ba. Negative 150 milliseconds. Ba. Negative 100. Ba. Still sounding like a B. Negative 30. Ba. Still a B. Negative 15. Ba. Still a B. Zero. Ba. Still a B. Negative 20. Or no, this is positive 20. Ba. Wow, that sounds a little more like a P. Ba. And that one's definitely sounding like a P. Ba. Clearly a P. Pa. And clearly a P, right? So as we move up this this um this between negative 250 and 35, there is a sudden moment right about there at which we switch over from being a B sound to being a P sound, even though um it's a very small actual difference in pronunciation, right? There is a, a specific moment where you switch that decision. You have two categories. And that's what categorical speech perception is, right? Um, and you can actually see this when you when you ask a bunch of speakers to identify sounds in a row, like we just did, right? Um, so you can move along at you know at negative 50 milliseconds, everyone identifies the sound as a B, and somewhere between 10 and 30 milliseconds, it switches over for English speakers. Right, so you switch over from being a P to being a B. People get really unsure right around 20, a little over 25 milliseconds is sort of when about 25 milliseconds is when people get really confused about is it a B or a P, um, but then their perception switches. Right, so that's categorical perception. It's two strong categories. It's a really small um, area in which it's unclear. So the question is, is this perceptual boundary something that we're born with that's just a feature of the human mind, or is it something that we have to learn when we learn a language? Um, when we look at um, uh, the English language on this spectrum, remember we had something just between sort of 20 and 25 is, uh, is, the, is the category line for English. But as it turns out, when you look at Spanish, the category line is just over zero. Right, so the fact that there's a difference between English speaker, adult speakers of English and adult speakers of Spanish um, between what we perceive as a B and what we perceive as a P suggests that there's some learning that goes on. So it can't be completely inborn, right? There's some, at the point when we're learning a language, we have to make that decision about where that boundary is. Um, let's look at another. So in Northern Paiute, there's actually two different boundaries because they have three different categories, right? So they've, they, it's not just a B, but we have a B and another B and then a P, right? So there's three different categories um, which have two different bound, there's two different boundaries that children have to learn. So there's clearly some learning going on at about where we place these boundaries um, for voice onset time.
So babies must learn the boundaries for their language. Um, it makes you think that maybe newborns can hear all the possible boundaries, right? So this is this is a theory called the universal theory, um, in which the infant is a, is called a universal listener, meaning they can hear all the possible boundaries between sounds, um, and they haven't decided where the sound boundaries go in their language yet. So if we're trying to test whether infants recognize a difference between two sounds, we use dishabituation. And you can use a high amplitude sucking experiment to test this in infants like four months old, right? Um, so this is, we're, we're gonna look just at a reduced timeline of voice onset time, because we don't really need that whole thing going down to 250, negative 250 anymore. Um, so we just have the release happening here, and these are all gonna be positive voice onset times. Um, now imagine that you, um, so if you're an adult speaker of English, your boundary is right about there between P and B. It's right there. So if we habituate an infant to hearing a ba sound at 20 milliseconds, um, if we do that for an adult, right, an adult will notice the difference between these two. So an adult notices that difference because we've crossed that boundary in voice onset time. So it sounds like ba and pa. Um, but an adult, uh, an infant, we don't know whether an infant will notice that difference. Um, now we can go down in the same, in the opposite direction, the same difference in the sound, the same amount of sound difference, um, and give an, a voice onset time of zero and figure out do infants and adults recognize that difference. And adults don't recognize that difference. So it's still a B sound to adults. It doesn't sound like a different sound. Um, I mean, you can hear it, but if, you know, you wouldn't predictably be able to say which one it is. Um, and infants, though, you know, if they really can hear all possible differences, they should dishabituate. They should notice that. If they notice the first one, they should notice the second one, right? So let's look at what research actually was. So this study was done in 1971, um, and this is the results, right? So this is testing whether they dishabituate to the adult boundary. So this is going from 20 milliseconds to 40 milliseconds. Um, this middle one is whether they dishabituate for the one that has no adult boundary, but is the same difference in sound. So this is between 20 milliseconds and zero milliseconds. And this is a control where they've done no difference, right? There's no difference in the sound. They just keep doing the same sound, right? And as you can see, um, that group where they did it right where the adult boundary is definitely dishabituated. They noticed that difference between P and B when they were presented with 20 milliseconds and had it hop up to 40 milliseconds. Um, but neither of these groups really did dishabituated, right? They didn't notice a difference between the, the 20 milliseconds and the zero, which is surprising, right? Because we sort of thought maybe the ones in the middle group would dishabituate just as much as the ones on the left group. So this is a surprising result. Um, four month old babies are perceiving sound categories with regard to these stops, just like adult English speakers are, right? So this is all done with English speakers. And so we would, you know, right. So, so four month old infants are perceiving these categories just like adults are. So this leaves us with a big problem when we're talking about how does a kid learn Spanish, right? So um, for, for English, the boundary is here at about 20, 25 to 30 milliseconds between P and B. But remember for Spanish, it's down here almost at zero, right? So B and P, the B and P boundary is, is, is really much different. So if we're asking Spanish speaking adults whether, whether um, they can hear the difference between 20 and 40 milliseconds, which English speakers can hear just fine, the difference between 20 and 40 milliseconds is um, not important to adults, but the difference between zero and 20 is important to Spanish speaking adults. So this switches from, from the English um, expectations. Um, and so how weird is it that an infant wouldn't be able to hear the one that adults speak and would be able to hear the one that adults don't hear, right? So, so is this really the result that we're getting, right? And how does the infant then figure out, oh, I need to switch those around and notice this side instead of that side, right? How weird is that, right? That is actually what the research has shown. So when you look at infants learning Spanish, um, the, the adult boundary between phonemes, between P and B, is between zero and 20, but the infant boundary that they notice is the same one that English, speak, English learning babies are noticing at this age. So between 20 and 40 milliseconds. 
And actually, if you look at a language where there are no boundaries, like Kikuyu, right? So it, for adults, there is no boundary based on voicing. This doesn't matter um, to the adult's language. Um, infants notice all these different boundaries, right? So in this study, they actually tested more boundaries than just the English boundary, just to see are there other boundaries that children are noticing, right? And so infants are noticing all these different boundaries, even though they're learning a language that has no boundaries, right? So by four months, there are boundaries that infants are noticing more than others, right? So, so um, infants are sensitive to a lot of boundaries, but they're not sensitive to all the boundaries, right? They have decided this, this Spanish, this one that's important to Spanish between zero and 20 milliseconds is not that important to listen to. Um, and they haven't focused in on that as an important boundary yet. So um, how do we reconcile this and account for this learning? Um, and usually one way that you can account for this is through something called attunement theory. And what attunement theory basically says is that infants, when they're born, are especially sensitive to certain potential boundaries. Um, um, and we don't really know why they're particularly sensitive to this. This might be the property of the ear that makes those boundaries you know, stand out. It might be a property of the way we process sound. Um, it might even be a property of the way we process language, right? But, we, but they are particularly sensitive to certain potential boundaries at birth, but then either they stop paying attention to all or some of the boundaries, right? So um, English speaking children will stop, English learning children will eventually stop paying attention to the difference between zero and negative 30 milliseconds, because those are all just Bs. Kukuyu speaking children will, will um, stop paying attention to all the boundaries because they realize it doesn't matter. Um, and then they'll focus in on only those boundaries that are relevant to them. So English learning children, it is relevant whether you have voice on at time of zero millis or, or 20 milliseconds up to 40 milliseconds, that is an important boundary. And so they will focus in on that boundary and get it right. Um, or maybe they realize that they need to shift their first guess boundaries, right? So they realize there's a boundary here and my first guess about where that boundary fell was wrong. Let's listen really carefully and figure out where that boundary would be. And that's what Spanish speaking children are doing. And this process of figuring out where your boundaries are relative to your first guesses is called attunement. Um, and we like attunement. We like attunement because it's a lot like the process we use to learn lots of other features of language. So essentially what you're doing is you have an innate first guess about how this is going to work, right? You then do some hypothesis testing or data collection um, to see whether your innate first guess is right or wrong. Um, and that will lead you to either say, wow, that innate first guess seems to work to account for all the data that I hear. Um, or you'll say, hmm, that innate first guess isn't right. Let me go back and reassess this. Now, remember when we talked about um, uh, hypothesis testing and how that works to figure out um, plural suffix um, stuff in, in English, how to pronounce the plural suffix on sounds that you've never heard before, right? And this, this, this explains that poverty of the stimulus question, right? So this would explain poverty of the stimulus and why it is that um, if you all of a sudden were to hear a voice onset um, contrast that you had never heard before, you would still assume that, if, that, that your boundaries were correct, for example, right? Um, so then you have this question about when does this decision get made? Um, as it turns out, researchers found that this decision about where the boundaries are for your language gets made by about 10 months of age, right? So it happens somewhere between six and 10 months, right around you know, eight or nine months is when you're making these decisions. Um, and so this is an important time in, uh, in the learn how you learn how to understand your own language. Um, this is when you go from being a much broader listener of languages to being a language-specific listener. Um, so this is an important moment in language development.